So welcome back to the channel. Today we have a different kind of video to my usual video. Something that I want to incorporate more on the channel is this idea of me sort of giving my reactions to articles I read. As some of you might know, I read fashion articles every single morning. It's kind of part of my routine. And there are always interesting things I learn or I just discover from reading these articles. So I thought actually, why don't I you know, bring some attention to writers I like, articles I've read that are really interesting, and sort of say what my takeaways were from each article. So today specifically, I wanted to talk about um, an article I recently read, which was an interview with Phoebe Philo that was done by Vanessa Friedman. She's one of my favorite journalists. Recently, I made a video about um, some fashion journalists that you should check out. She was on the list. Um, she worked for the New York Times and this was actually the first interview that Phoebe Philo has done in 10 years. So a big deal, Phoebe Philo is someone that is very incognito. I won't bore you with, you know, Phoebe Philo's impact, whether we're talking about Celine or Chloe or whether we're talking about, you know, people that have learnt under her and eventually become really, really good designers in their own right. Those are people like Daniel Lee, Peter Doe, Rock Huang. Uh, these kind of designers. But yeah, if you want to learn more, um, you can Google it or I'm sure there are loads of videos on YouTube for you to learn about Phoebe Philo as well. So how we're going to do this is I'm going to read sections of the article and then kind of give my thoughts on what the exact takeaway is. Um, so the first takeaway is kind of around the reluctance to talk about her work or sort of describe it or explain it. Um, so to read the article, it says, I don't feel that there's a huge amount of storytelling that needs to be done. I'm not particularly into that. I don't feel myself that I need a lot of that from other fashion houses. I feel that it's just not necessary. To a certain extent, you either like it or you don't. Someone telling me a story isn't going to make me like it more. It is a coat. It's a pair of trousers. I do appreciate a level of straightforwardness. And so my first takeaway from this is that Phoebe Philo is a bit of a realist, which I kind of like. Um, if you guys are subscribed to the Patreon, you would know all about this, but someone who I really like, not just for his work, but also the way he talks about fashion is Tom Ford. I think that Tom Ford is one of those people that when you read about interviews, he talks about, you know, the luxury fashion space. We sell perfumes because the profit margin is high and it's really good for the business. We do this because this, he doesn't fake it or try to pretend that he's doing more than he is or, you know, there's more mystique or there's more narrative rather than no, we're just selling this because it makes, it's good for the profit margins and stuff. And I always loved that Tom Ford was a realist and it almost made me be more drawn to everything that he did because he was under no pretense about what he was doing. And I think a lot of fashion designers, when you read their interviews, and maybe with this series of me reviewing articles, this will be a theme where you'd see that every time I read interviews from designers, they end up contradicting themselves a lot. And it makes me think that a lot of designers aren't necessarily self-aware, which I don't think is necessarily a bad thing. I think that if you're a designer and you're constantly in your studio, just working away and making amazing art and amazing clothes, I can see how you lack a sense of understanding of how people generally think and just what's going on in the outside world. Whereas on the flip side, I'm literally a journalist. It's my job to know everything that's going on, I guess. Um, so it's different. So my first takeaway was that Phoebe Philo is a realist. Her work, as we kind of all knew already, is all about you know building a cohesive wardrobe for women that makes women feel good and also steers away from the male gaze, which is why a lot of her silhouettes have you know that wider silhouette it's kind of flowy um it's not skin tight and like shows all the body and all that sort of stuff so that's kind of her vibe um so it's good to get her you know confirming this in words um because i think a lot of what drew women to phoebe philo is it's this idea of women designing for women and understanding what women actually need because in this interview phoebe philo talks about you know so many details that she overthinks when it comes to what would be the experience of a woman wearing this piece? And she thinks about it over and over again. And even if she wouldn't necessarily wear it, it's something that she has seen herself potentially wearing and therefore she thinks about, you know, all the things that could go wrong and all those sort of things, which is nice. I guess the only point from this takeaway that I don't agree with is saying that no one cares about narrative in clothes. I think what draws people to a lot of brands is narrative, whether we're talking about designers like Martin Magella, 
Um, there's so many stories that people talk about when we talk about Martin Magella's work or, you know, other people that do narrative, even people like Tebe Magugu, like a new designer, newish designer. Um, what I love about his work is actually the storytelling through clothes. So I just think there's different customer bases for different people. Um, and I think that was kind of a sweeping statement by Phoebe Fallo to say that, you know, um, no one cares about narrative. Um, at the end of the day, it's just trousers. I don't think that's the case for everyone. I don't think every consumer is like that. But I definitely would say that the Phoebe Philo customer um, doesn't go to Phoebe Philo for narrative. So I can agree with that. And it's very interesting to just see, once again, the takeaway that she's a realist. The next takeaway is managing expectations. And so when she was asked about all the fanfare and the anticipation of her return, what she said was, there may have been an expectation that I could have provided everything to everyone immediately. And that's just not possible. It takes time and effort to make most things that have meaning. One has to stand for something. And I do think that that's a very good point for Phoebe Philo herself to bring up because I think that when a designer has had such an amazing run, people's expectations are sky high. And I think we need to remember that from my understanding of just observing fashion um, as long as I have been, you notice that a lot of fashion is praised in hindsight. A lot of times when things are going on, people don't understand it. And so people kind of, I guess, bash it in a way um, and critique it. And sometimes the critiques are very valid and sometimes they're not. But a good example is Hood by Air. There were a lot of fashion critics that didn't really understand it. And then when it ended and Shane Oliver moved on to different things like Anonymous Club and all that, everyone now in hindsight says, oh my God, Hood by Air was so revolutionary. The same thing happened to Alexander McQueen, whether it's the Bumpsters and people saying he's sexualizing women and all these things that he was doing. At the time, the reviews on McQueen's work were really negative. Um, they thought he was like obnoxious and all this stuff. And it's now in hindsight, we're now like, oh yeah, McQueen was a genius. Look at his tailoring, the Savile Row tailoring that he put into the silhouettes of the trousers and stuff. So I think everything is in hindsight. And I think in Phoebe Philo's case, bringing that back, because she did so much at Chloe and then at Celine, we have years and years and years of hindsight and of a body of work to really analyze, to be like, this was really interesting, how she created a whole wardrobe for women that women followed like a cult. And just product, she makes product amazing. She makes things that always look good, right? To the point where men were even wearing her clothes that were really intended to be worn on women, like Kanye West was wearing Phoebe Philo Celine, right? So it's one of those things where her, you know, starting her eponymous label and deciding to start a brand she was never going to live up to the expectations of people being like oh my god phoebe philo is back because at the end of the day she's only had what two drops now in comparison to the massive body of work at celine and chloe we just need to really give her time and i really like that she basically essentially said that yeah you can't give everyone everything at once it's literally impossible and i totally agree with her point there and quickly before i move on to the next takeaway i want to read a quote of one of phoebe philo's customers who talked about why she wears phoebe philo so to read it it says ruthie rogers a chef and the co-founder of the river cafe in london who has known miss philo for decades is one of the women who wears it she said that since she discovered miss philo celine basically that's all i wore and now she is a Phoebe Philo customer. She bought pieces from the first collection because she said, they are clothes for a woman who doesn't want to be sexualized, but they don't deny her sexuality. And I think that's a very good way to, you know, summarize kind of what Phoebe Philo's aesthetic or the appeal of her clothes to women. So the next takeaway is in terms of her rollout and how she decided essentially to roll out her collection so to read that section of the article it says miss philo views her work as one continuous collection and does not believe in seasons which is why she prefers the word edit and divides those edits into deliveries when the terminology was first introduced along with the statement that the brand intentionally made less than the anticipated demand it was widely misinterpreted as a strategy calculated to drum up extreme consumer fear of missing out or fomo miss philo said that was actually not her aim the point was to create a baseline of data 
to help her figure out how much she would need to produce to satisfy her market without ending up with lots of stuff to liquidate and to encourage customers to build a coherent wardrobe slowly over time. That's why customers were asked to sign up via email to be alerted about deliveries. I don't know why there has to be such a beginning and end in our industry, Ms. Philo said. I don't know why it just can't be continuous. And I do think that this was an interesting assumption. This was definitely um, not an assumption I made, but definitely a point I brought up when I initially reviewed uh, Phoebe Philo's first drop. Uh, so what that assumption is, is that everything seemed to sell out really quickly. And so one of the things that I speculated is that clearly there must be, there must not be a lot of stock because of just how quickly the clothes, you know, sold out. And of course now Phoebe Philo has actually confirmed that she didn't produce a lot of stock, but online I saw this narrative of her wanting to create sort of a, you know, demand for, and I think this is maybe a point I also brought up too, but wanting to create this sort of false economy, this sort of demand that, oh my God, everyone loves Phoebe Philo, look at how fast it's selling out and it adds to the cachet and the mystique of the brand, right? But now she's confirming that actually that's not why I did it. I was just trying to gauge the market, which is very plausible and very normal. When I first released my magazine, my magazine sold out really quickly, not because I necessarily have trillions of people that wanted to buy my magazine it's simply because i just didn't print many copies because i had never launched a magazine before and considering i had to put so much money up front printing the issues um paying people that worked on it and all that stuff so i didn't want to just lose tons of money doing it so i was like let me be conservative and only print a certain amount and then it sold out really quickly and i was like oh clearly I underestimated the market. Next time when I do this, I'll just print more. And that's kind of the similar thing that Phoebe Philo is doing. It's like, okay, let me gauge the market for my eponymous label because we don't really have the data yet as far as my eponymous label goes. Let's see how much we release. Let's see how it sells, what sells, what does well, what doesn't do well, what sells quicker. And that way we can kind of bring merchandising in where we know, okay, our customers like this kind of product and that kind of product. So it's kind of really just testing the market and that's completely normal. And I think that this was a good takeaway because it's good to hear it from Phoebe Philo herself. So we know that that's the case. And this point also goes back to the initial point that Phoebe Philo made in terms of her work being a continuous thing rather than her you know, not trying to give everyone everything at once. And she doesn't want to do that because she feels like she can't do that, which she can't, to be honest. Um, so yes, nothing new. This is the philosophy of Phoebe Philo that everyone has known about. The next takeaway is the actual reason why she came back to fashion, which is very important because before Phoebe Philo was announced as returning to fashion, for years, everyone, especially a lot of my female friends, they would, you know, be like, we really miss Phoebe Philo. Her kind of aesthetic is kind of not there. Yes, we have Peter Doe and we have Daniel Lee and we have, you know, Rock and all these kind of people, but then all of them have completely different aesthetics. I think Daniel Lee's Bottega was probably the closest to that, but it's still not Phoebe Philo, right? Um, and so they just missed it. They missed the vibe. They missed, you know, a woman designing for women in fashion, especially at the highest level. And so, yeah, there was just so much speculation as why did she leave? Why won't she come back? When will she come back if she does? No one knew what was going on behind the scenes. And there's a really long part of the article that I think all of you should read. I'll leave the link to the whole article in the description below. But she talks about wanting to have, you know, balance in life, which I thought was really important. I think mental health is something that we should talk about when it comes to designers a lot more. I'm quite surprised that we don't. If you guys have watched the Kingdom of Dreams documentary series, you see in that series, for example, designers like Marc Jacobs, Alexander McQueen, John Galliano, how much the stress and just the, the expectation really and the pressure of fashion got to them and essentially led to them self-destructing. We know what happened to John Galliano. We know what happened to McQueen. We know that Marc Jacobs had to check into rehab at one point. And so I find it crazy that we have all these stories in fashion, we have all these case studies, and still, you know, mental health is not a conversation that is completely at the forefront of fashion. I think that's strange. And I think that is definitely something that needs to change. And so in this part of the article, it's really good to, to hear, obviously, Vanessa Friedman mentioned, rightfully so, that Phoebe Philo was the first woman to 
have maternity leave to take maternity leave at a major brand which is actually quite insane at one point she wanted to focus on her children um you know that's why there was even a gap between when she was at chloe from when she went to celine um she values a lot of you know work life balance i guess um and doesn't really you know want the stress and the ultimate pressure of fashion to sort of change who she is fundamentally which is quite interesting but then over a lot of deliberation she realized that she missed fashion and fashion is where she feels like her presence can be felt and where she feels that she can make a lot of impact even though she still wants to have sort of a balance in life so to read a section of the article that touches on this but like i said you can check the link in the description below and actually read the full interview for yourself but it says, quite quickly, I realized that work was something I needed, she said. And I think I had a sense it was actually going to be within fashion. Even if she knew she didn't want to go back to what she had done. In most big houses, designers' jobs end at the runway. They don't oversee the ad campaigns or the merchandising or the store design. Miss Philo wanted to have fingers in all of that. Even if independence and startup meant not flying first class or having a driver or lots of orchids in the office. Fundamentally, that is not the stuff that makes me happy, Miss Philo said. The stuff that makes her happy involves baking, galleries, riding, clubbing, her family, her friends. She said she is constantly walking the tightrope between ensuring downtime and discovering inspiration. Once she knows she can trust you, there are no barriers, Miss Rogers said. Now, the last takeaway that I got from this article that was really interesting was around two things. So the price, why the price is as high as it is. And I have a lot to say about that. And then also why she decided to name her brand after herself. So I'll read that section of the article and then I'll essentially say my thoughts. My learning curve has never been greater, Miss Philo said. I think people imagine that somehow we had been quietly building a huge organization but I had maybe two members of staff. I'm involved in renting space, buying office furniture. She currently has about 100 employees. Mr. Miles was one of the people she contacted early on when she was forming the idea of what her brand might be. They talked about it, he said, for maybe two years, about the meta issues of what it means to translate your name from something personal to something corporate, from something you own to something everyone can own. I toyed with the idea of made up names, Miss Philo said. Some words are satisfying to say. Some of them are really rude as well. There are really good swear words. So that's the first part. That's about the name. Now I find it very interesting, once again, that she was talking about this idea of discussing the difference between having your name a personal thing versus your name as a corporate thing. A very funny uh, thing from, uh, one of the documentaries I watched years ago, um, it's called The Look by Jeremy Newson. It's like this documentary series, and you can find it on YouTube if you just type The Look, Jeremy Newson. He made this series of documentaries in fashion between, I think it was 1989 to 1995. And he just went around, you know, all these different runway shows, interviewing designers and just talking about fashion. And every single episode had a different theme. So one episode had a theme on, the press and the, the power of the press in fashion. One talked about the business of fragrances and perfume. One talked about the power of fabrics where they were talking about different designers that have done innovative things in that respect, like Ise Miyake. So it's very interesting anyway. In one of the episodes, I can't remember exactly which one, Donna Karen was talking about when she started her brand and she got loads of mail and she was like, I'm so popular, like why do people always want to mail me things and then she realized oh my personal name is the name of the brand and so she started to get confused between personal mail and mail that's just for the company donna karen and so that's kind of where you start to split hairs between your personal name and the corporate name well donna karen ought to know turnover has reached 240 million in a brief six years and her name has soared into the designer big league donna karen oh i was opening up people's mail when my, I used to walk around this entire company opening up everything because I said, how nice, look at all this mail I'm getting because <laughs> my name was on everything. 
<laughs> it had because I didn't realize that this became a company. So uh, it was very, very strange. Everything that bared my name, I would go to. And then there are also questions of the rights to the name, the fact that someone else can own the rights. For example, we know what happened to Jill Sander. Jill Sander obviously sold the rights to her brand, which runs under her name. So then she lost the ability to trade under her own name, which is really strange. And she even got like basically pushed out of the brand um, before they brought like other designers of many of which you guys know. Funny enough, one of the reasons why uh, Raf Simmons actually got to work at Jill Sander was partially because of Jill Sander being pushed out, but that's neither here nor there. Um, but yeah, so it's just one of those things where even now Jill Sander has this collaboration with Uniqlo that's ongoing and it's called J Plus because once again, she can't trade under the name Jill Sander. So it's all these different implications that you have to think of, but it's interesting that she eventually came to this understanding that Phoebe Philo just seems like the most fitting name for the brand and also kind of makes the most sense. So that's interesting. I want to see how that plays out because once again, if she ever sells the rights to her brand, which is very possible, Yes, she's a majority owner, but LVMH has a minority stake. And if they see loads of success, I can imagine Bernard Arnault is going to give Phoebe Philo a a, an amount of money that she can't say no to. And Phoebe Philo can just set off into the sunset. But then once again, now you can't trade under the name Phoebe Philo anymore if you start anything else. So interesting thing. And of course, the second part of the takeaway, like I said, are the prices of the clothes. So I'm going to read her quote and then I'm going to talk about why it's so expensive and, you know, my thoughts on the prices. So what she said was, the intention really is that the pieces stick around for a while, Miss Philo said. They have to be made well and they have to be considered. And that tends to come at a price point. Now, this is where, this is probably the only part where I heavily disagreed with Phoebe Philo because remember, Early on, I said that Phoebe Philo is a realist, but then the realism starts to get lost in like this kind of quote where she says, um, it tends, so things being made well tends to come at a price point, which in this case, she's saying, that's why, you know, I have a coat that sells for $25,000. Now, anyone that's worked in fashion or in production or anywhere near a factory knows how much things that are well-made cost to make. It's not that expensive. It's just so disgusting that a lot of luxury brands cut corners so much that I think consumers now have a warped idea of how much things should even cost in the first place. Um, and so I could, in a factory, probably wholesale price, you could make production price, you could make a very, very, very high quality garment for maximum, 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 three to 400 pounds. If you're using, the only time it would cost significantly more than that is if you're using the rarest of rarest walls, like on Savile Row, in some of the suits, they use like some insane wall that's so rare, and it actually is expensive enough to where they can justify charging you 30,000 you know, dollars for a suit. That makes sense. Um, but if it's just a general cotton, that's, a, you know, well-made or something's made out of polyester or some like polyester cotton blend or whatever fabric, it's not that expensive to make. So justifying it by saying, you know, things that are well-made have to come at a price point. I totally disagree. That is just not true. Things don't have to cost $10,000. However, I don't, that being said, I don't have an issue with what Phoebe Philo charges because at the end of the day, it's her brand. She can charge whatever she wants and then it's up to consumers to decide if they want to buy that or not. Um, all I'm saying is that if you think that the reason why things have to cost $25,000 is because that's what it costs to get quality garments, then you would be terribly wrong. Um, you can get things that are significantly cheaper that are just as well made, if not better made than what Phoebe Philo makes, for example. And that's where her realism starts to get lost on me because it, just say people are buying, I can charge that because that those are the prices I charged when I worked at Celine and when I worked at Chloe. So my customer base is used to paying those charges. And a lot of people now that have, you know, taken my aesthetic or are inspired by my work in some sort of way, for example, the row, charge similar prices. So it makes sense 
from a marketing standpoint and just a brand positioning standpoint to charge that price. That is what she should have said, and that is the actual truth of the matter. This whole, you know, things that are good quality have to come at a certain price point, it's just, yeah, it's just no. <laughs> and that's why I really heavily disagreed with her. Um, but yeah, this article was really interesting. I loved reading through it, and I loved going through it again. Let me know if you guys enjoy me sort of dissecting articles and talking about my takeaways in that way. Um, this is kind of like a new format. So the only reason I would continue doing videos like this is if you guys enjoy it. Um, otherwise, I'll continue just doing what I do, like the runway reviews and other videos that I make. But yeah, thank you so much for watching. And I'll be back with another video very soon. This YouTube channel runs on your support. If you want to support the channel, you can subscribe to my Patreon. You'll gain access to exclusive content that includes everything from my Patreon podcast, where I give a behind the scenes insight into the fashion industry, as well as a fashion book club, where I review my favorite fashion books. You can also check out my fashion ebook, which highlights the best fashion journalists to follow, definitions of common fashion terminology, and how to determine what a good source of fashion information is. The links to everything are in the description below. 